Thank you, Rusty, and welcome to um, our symposium today. The title of which, as you presumably know already, or I assume you wouldn't be here this afternoon, is Domestication and Human Evolution. And we can define domestication as the selective breeding of animals and plants to accentuate traits that humans find favorable in some way for their own purposes. But since this symposium is what we at Carter like to call transdisciplinary to a high degree, it may not be readily apparent what domestication directly has to do with human evolution. So in these introductory remarks, I'd like to briefly entertain the question of the ways in which domestication might be relevant to human evolution. And in doing so, I'll touch on a number of the topics that our speakers today will discuss more in more detail as they present their talks. But since the talks this afternoon cover a wide variety of topics, what I'd like to do here is try to connect some of the dots for you ahead of time so that as uh, speakers present their own data, you can begin to make some of these connections for yourselves. At the largest level, the overarching question is how to account for qualitative changes in evolution, which has been a longstanding debate in evolutionary biology. And just to be clear, by quantitative changes, we mean differences in degree or just basically more of the same stuff. Whereas by qualitative changes, we mean differences in kind or new and different kinds of stuff. At the next level, with regard to human origins and uniqueness, which is the focus of CARTA, this larger question is sometimes framed in what's called the discontinuity paradox. So human abilities appear qualitatively different or discontinuous from those of related species, and yet we know that they have to have come from somewhere evolutionarily. And the question that results from this paradox is often formulated is, how did we get from there to here? Which is much like the question Rusty showed you earlier. And the answers that have been provided to this question can be divided into two main classes. First, gradualist solutions, which was the route that Darwin took, denying that change could occur in large and rapid leaps, but rather occurred only in small incremental steps that over time would enhance an organism's fitness profile, occasionally also leading ultimately to a difference in kind, for example, a new species. In opposition to this view are saltational solutions, which propose additional mechanisms to account for apparent jumps in the evolutionary record. And virtually all of the challenges to Darwin's original proposal over the years have been of a saltational nature. A number of mechanisms have been proposed for rapid evolutionary change that appear discontinuous, including macromutations, exaptation, in which a change in function drives further evolution of a structure. So for example, uh, the swim bladder in fish was originally for purposes of flotation, but once fish decided to crawl out of the water onto land, it began to serve the function of respiration, which drove its further evolution. And we, of course, know a lot about hybridization, particularly from horticultural studies, Mendel, etc. But here we're going to focus on domestication to see how much rapid change and how many apparent discontinuities it can account for. And it's important to remember that the first chapter of Darwin's The Origin of Species was precisely about domestication. And it included this rather prophetic quote. Hence, if man goes on selecting and thus augmenting any peculiarity, he will almost certainly unconsciously modify other parts of the structure owing to the mysterious laws of the correlation of growth. And you should see a number of examples of that this afternoon. As we will hear at the latest by the end of the afternoon today, when Richard Rangham will address this topic directly, the hypothesis that humans may have domesticated themselves over the course of their history, perhaps more than once, has become a popular and attractive idea in recent years, as it has the potential to solve many of the longstanding puzzles of human evolution. So among the uniquely human features that have at one time or another been proposed as discontinuous, I've selected the following to talk about briefly as relevant to our discussion of domestication today. So this will sort of be a blitz of main topics. So let's begin with skull morphology. First of all, um, with regard to so-called facial retraction. It's obvious looking across, across the paleoanthropological fossil record that prognathism or protrusion of the lower face has been greatly reduced over millions of years in hominin evolution. Even compared to our most recent hominin relative, the Neanderthals, it seems clear that there have been significant changes uh, in the skull. Uh, the face is now tucked underneath the brain case rather than situated in front of it, and facial height has also been significantly reduced. Modern humans are unique among mammals in lacking facial projection, and facial retraction has been cited as one of the two primary features that determine the skull configuration of anatomically modern humans. The obvious question that arises then is, of course, what's the underlying cause of facial retraction? 
There have been a number of proposals over the year, but the interesting thing about considering the role of domestication in human evolution is that facial retraction could have come about for free without having been selected for directly, as this is a common feature of domesticated species relative to their original wild types. Because under domestication across species, there's an apparent preservation of juvenile characteristics into adulthood, also known as pedomorphosis. Note that juvenile australopithecine skulls, like the famous Tong child fossil shown here, do not exhibit many of the <coughs> cranial features of an adult australopithecine, such as pronounced brow ridges and a protruding face. Instead, it shows a more human-like brain case and teeth. It has thus been pointed out that modern adult human and even Neanderthal skulls retain many of the morphological features of infant chimp, bonobo, and australopithecine skulls. This is an example of what's called neoteny, or slow development. Turning our attention to the domestication of dogs, the first domesticated animal species, which Robert Wayne will be telling us about next, a fairly recent report of an estimated 33,000-year-old canid skull in Siberia confirms that facial retraction is a feature of early canid evolution as well. A shortened snout and mandible, or lower jaw, are criterial for distinguishing the skulls of early dogs from those of wolves. These appear to be changes that occur under domestication. This figure compares the skull morphology of the Siberian fossil to various other ancient and modern canids. Ancient and modern wolf measurements are shaded in pink on the right, and early dogs are in white on the left. If we use the ancient Pleistocene wolf, the straight red line on the right side of the figure, as a baseline, baseline, we can see that cranial features get smaller across the board in both modern wolves and early canids, but most notably in snout length, not unlike the pattern we saw in hominin facial retraction. And Robert Franciscus will be talking later in detail about parallel changes in human and canine cranial morphology. But for now, we can say that the skulls of early dogs differ from those of wolves in many of the same ways that the skulls of puppies differ from those of adult dogs. What's remarkable about the Siberian silver fox domestication project, which Anna Kukiekova will be talking about today, is that these same changes in skull morphology, namely shorter and wider snouts and more feminized skulls, that occurred over thousands of years were replicated in a very short period of time, just a few years, under a strict artificial selection process of domestication, in which farmed foxes were allowed to breed only if they showed lack of aggressive or fearful tendencies in the presence of humans. Pictured here is Ludmilla Trut, the current head of the project with one of the domesticated foxes. Of course, the size and shape of the skull are not independent of its contents, namely the brain, so now let us turn our attention to that. Everyone is aware of the fact that humans have overly large brains. This is in part due to the fact that even in utero, human brains develop more rapidly than the brains of other apes, as shown in the top graph. This accelerated growth rate continues throughout human gestation, whereas it starts to drop off in chimpanzees about halfway through the gestational period, as shown in the second graph. Moreover, this accelerated rate, growth rate continues after birth into the first postnatal year, resulting ultimately in a relatively large adult brain sign, size. Thus, as we see in this graph, human brain to body weight sits well above the primate linear trend. And as Terry Deacon has pointed out, if we were to grow bodies large enough to warrant our current brain size, given general primate trends, then we would be 10 feet tall like the Navi in Avatar. <laughs> but now we run into a paradox because mammalian brain size actually decreases under domestication as shown for a variety of mammalian species in this table from Kruska 1988. Note at the bottom that brain size in dogs decreases by as much as 30% from um, wild-type wolves. And in fact, relative to our archaic Homo sapiens ancestors, based on reconstructions of the brain from this fossilized skull, it appears to be the case that our brains, those of anatomically modern Homo sapiens, have actually shrunk since the upper Paleolithic period. So how do we account for this paradox? Terry Deacon will be addressing this question in his talk, but as a preview, we can say that within our species, modern human brains are smaller than those of early Homo sapiens, but across primate species, human brains are vastly larger relative to body size. The within species change could be one of self-domestication because, as Richard Wrangham will point out at the end, bonobos, recognized to be less aggressive than common chimps, also show reduced relative cranial capacity and brain size. And as we saw, increased relative adult brain size in humans could be due to the developmental changes that lead to both accelerated and prolonged growth rates in infants. 
There's also evidence, however, that part of the reason may be a delay in certain aspects of cortical development in humans. So let's talk about neoteny and brain development for a second, which Philip Kaitovich will be discussing in greater detail in his talk. Relative to other primate species, human brain development exhibits delays in both gene expression and synaptic development of prefrontal cortex. Similarly, across all regions of cortex, myelination of neocortical axons, and let's remind ourselves for a moment that myelin is the fatty substance that insulates the axonal processes of neurons to improve their conductivity, just like insulation on a wire. Myelination in chimps plateaus as they age, but this is not the case for humans, where myelination continues well into adulthood. This figure shows it continuing into the third decade of life, as a matter of fact. Perhaps most importantly, all these delays in neocortical development may help to explain our discontinuous cognitive abilities relative to other primates, as such delays provide more opportunity for social learning while the brain is still developing and wiring itself up. So far, we've talked about skull and brain changes in human evolution, which are, of course, not unrelated, and how they relate to similar changes that we see under domestication. In both cases, we've seen evidence pointing to the persistence of juvenile traits and growth patterns into adulthood. This brings us to the topic of so-called sensitive periods during development, which are similarly extended under domestication with interesting consequences for behavior. The human vocal learning period, the so-called critical period for language, during which it's crucial that children be exposed to language, is another uniquely human feature. As you are probably aware, puppies go through an initial sensitive period during which they're able to form social bonds with humans. This developmental window closes when dogs begin to show fear of unknown stimuli, the, so, the onset of the so-called fear response. Interestingly, not only is the onset of the fear response delayed in dogs relative to wolves, but it is also delayed and domesticated relative to non-domesticated foxes living under the same conditions in the same farm environment. Let us now address the deeply philosophical question of what does the fox say? <laughs> Although foxes and wolves rarely bark, fox and wolf cubs do. And although foxes do not naturally go through a sensitive vocal learning period, either in the wild or under domestication, it is nonetheless the case that adult domesticated foxes retain juvenile vocal behaviors of barking and whining, as do dogs, of course, which I can verify if you want to come to my neighborhood. <laughs> this brings us to the story of the finches. Here you see the wild type, the white-rumped or white-backed munia, and here you see its domesticated variety, the society or Bengalese finch on the right with the munia on the left. You will hear this fascinating story of domestication later from Kaz Okanawa, Okanaya, sorry. After more than 250 years of domestication, society finches show a variety of similar, though more dramatic developmental differences in their vocal learning period, during which young male birds acquire the adult male species appropriate song. The bottom line to all these changes is that the vocal learning period is longer in society finches, and they're more flexible learners, both as juveniles and apparently also as adults under certain experimental conditions. This brings us to the overcomplexity of language. So what do we mean by overcomplexity? Well, in English, the sentence relations of who's doing what to whom are generally indicated by word order. In English, Mary loves John clearly doesn't mean the same thing as John loves Mary, unfortunately for most of us. <laughs> Yet, when we use pronouns to express these same relations, we redundantly mark them to indicate what role they play in the sentence. Thus, she loves him versus he loves her. Note that we can remove this so-called case marking on the pronouns, and the sentence is still easily comprehensible, so we don't really need it at all. And in fact, we don't even need that pesky third-person singular S in the present tense either, which tortures so many non-native speakers of English, um, because if we get rid of it, it doesn't impair comprehension either because we can just rely on the word order again. Yet the language still retains these unnecessary and redundant markings, and this is what we mean by when we say that language is overly complex. It turns out that this may be another byproduct of the domestication process. As Kaz Okanaya will no doubt discuss, the Society Finch song has become noticeably more complex and more plastic than the song of the white-backed Munia, the wild type from which it was originally domesticated. So this has been just a brief overview of traits that might find at least part of their explanation in a process of self-domestication. But this gives rise to the question whether self-domestication is itself a valid concept. Here the comparison of chimps and bonobos, which Richard Rangham will be speaking about at the end of today, reveals that bonobos exhibit many of the traits that we associate with domesticated species in skull morphology, brain characteristics, and behavior, even though they have obviously not been domesticated by humans. So in conclusion, these are just some of the themes that are likely to resurface in various contexts throughout the course of the afternoon. 
which we hope will stimulate you to think about traits claimed to be unique to humans in a new light as we piece together the puzzle of the role of domestication in human evolution. Thank you very much.